This is episode number 31 of the Expert Table Tennis Podcast. My name is Ben Larkham and joining me on the show today is Tal Leibovitz. Now, for those of you that are regular listeners to the podcast, you'll know that I haven't put out an episode for a while. This is the first one of 2016. What's going to happen this year is that I'm going to be doing just one episode a month. So from now on, on the last Friday of the month, you will get an episode and an interview on the Expert Table Tennis podcast. I hope that's okay. It was taking up so much of my time in the last few months of 2015, just putting out an episode every week and finding guests. So I've decided to scale back a little bit, but we're going to have 12 brilliant interviews through the year. And I hope that you're still able to enjoy the show and get plenty of information from them. My guest on the show today, as I mentioned earlier, is Tal Leibovitz. Tal is part of the US Paralympic table tennis team. He is a gold medal winner previously at the Paralympics and has been playing table tennis for 25 years. I think this is going to be his fifth Paralympic Games. So loads of experience, loads of knowledge. He's written the book Ping Pong for Fighters, which we'll be talking about. And I'm just going to be asking him for you know, to, to basically share all of the tips that he's learned through those 25 years of playing table tennis at an elite level. It's a really great interview. I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you. I've been out of the game for so long that I forgot to do the, the little intro with Tal at the start of the podcast. So we're going to just jump straight into it. The next thing you hear will be our interview. And as I said, my guest today, Tal Leibovitz. Hope you enjoy it. I didn't realize what an interesting story you you had kind of like growing up and getting into table tennis. So it'd be good to to talk about that just because I think, you know, people will find that really interesting. Um, Sure. Yeah. Um, You know, it's actually I just did some speaking for some event at a um, it was at a Queens Museum. Um, and I was talking a little bit about that. But, yeah, I grew up uh, playing in the South Queens Boys and Girls Club. Uh, that's where I played. And um, I was homeless at that time. I didn't have anywhere to live. So I kind of was just doing table tennis um, all day long. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I think um, it was a good opportunity um, to be in that boys club because I was able to play like six, seven hours a day when I was growing up. And we had a, a group of us um, and we were playing against each other. So I think one of the reasons I was able to get to a good level is that I was challenged by other people. So I think that was yeah. really helpful. Um, from there, I went to a parks department and I started playing table tennis there. What's the, uh, what's the parks department? And I haven't oh, heard of that. Before. Okay, sure. Well, that's like a, uh, in New York, they have these kind of, uh, I guess they're, uh, you know, the parks, you know, and it's kind of hard to explain, but the city, there's, there's a guy named Robert Moses who was kind of the commissioner of the parks department and like the, I'm going to say it was the 1970s and he did a lot of changes and, and they just started a lot of different programs in these parks departments, like fitness programs. They have table tennis, they have weightlifting, uh, they have karate. Um, so I went to one of these kind of like city programs and I started, well, when I went there, I got I pretty much got killed. I couldn't even get a point. There were 21 point games and we have like a, in the U S there's a rating system where people have points. So yeah. most of the, players were about 2100 to 2300 so that's kind of like uh i guess you could say it's an intermediate level at least in the united states um yeah but, but i mean pretty serious players though yeah i mean they they play a lot and you know i i mean um yeah they, it was a pretty i would say i don't know how the leagues work very much in europe but i would say in germany if they were playing the league they may be that level of player might be division five maybe Somewhere, okay. somewhere around there. Yeah, so I, you know, I got to play them. It was pretty cool. And, um, of course, I got killed by everybody for the first year and a half. And then I started beating them, started winning against them. And, and there was two things, actually, that, that really helped me as a player. Um, one was I started watching the top players in the United States. And my level was so far behind them uh, – that I, I didn't think I could beat them because I was, you know, I was just starting out and I was playing maybe for a year or two. Um, and they were probably rating wise or 2,600, which is probably, um, again with the leagues, I mean, it's not top division, but it's, I mean, probably top 200 in the world, some of them. Sure. Um, but what I started doing, which was really helpful for me was, uh, I started thinking about where they were winning and losing points. So my, my real goal was to try to just play them and be able to, um, 
have a match where you know uh, I could actually compete with them. So that was my goal. I wasn't thinking about winning or losing. I actually didn't really even know if I could. I mean, I knew I couldn't win. Um, and I also knew I'd probably lose. So, um, but I was just thinking, you know what? I just want to compete with these players. So that was one. So I really started trying to give them a hard time watching where they were having trouble, watching where they were, you know, winning and losing points. So that was the first, uh, thing I think that was important, um, as a player. The second important thing was I played in the, I want to say, I think it was the New York state championships. And this was in 1998. So I had already been playing, a long period of time, probably about seven years. How old would you would you be about uh, at that point? Uh, at that point, see, I was born in seventy five, so I was about twenty three years old. I started when I okay. was fourteen. Yeah, so you started relatively late. A little bit late, yeah. If I would have started a little younger, it might have been. You know, it's it's really important. They say with table tennis to start younger. Um, I think that's important, but I think it's also important to be able to. Um, have a group of people that you're playing, that you're competing with and kind of battling against. So you kind of bring each other up. Um, but the other thing I'll say is I, I ended up winning a tournament and I beat a, a player. Actually, I beat a couple of players that were, that were very good. There were, some of them were, I guess they were close to 2,600 rating, which is, which is pretty good. Um, but something happened after that tournament, and I believe that I can compete with the players. I actually believed I had some kind of self-belief that I was like, you know what, I can compete, and maybe I can win sometimes. After that, my level's relatively been about the same, you know, meaning that I could, you know, I've, I was able to compete with just about, you know, anybody I played. So um, those are probably the two important things, I think, for me, um, you know, that helped me uh, become a good player. There's a lot yeah. of other things, but um, yeah, so those are the, the two important things. Yep. Sounds great. What, what kind of level are you playing at now, Tal? Well, right now I'm 40 years old, and I would say I think my USA TT rating uh, is 2450. Um, in the uh, para, because I play in the para uh, Olympics, like the para events, so I'm, I'm still top 10 in the world. And I've, I've had some pretty good results uh, the last two years. I, I won the Pan Am Games for the para event. Um, what else? I won the, I think I got a gold medal in the Romania Open, the uh, Romania Spain Open. I've won the U.S. Open, I think the last two times and a couple of other stuff. And I've also been playing okay in the able-bodied events. I was still, you know, in the, in the even the past few months, I've beaten a couple of 2,600 players, which is good. And, um, and recently I was at the U S nationals where we won the, uh, United States, um, club championship. It's like a team. It's all the clubs that play against each other. Um, okay. but we were kind of fortunate because a few of the teams defaulted. So we kind of got a little bit lucky there, and, but I'm still playing. Okay. Not bad. Great. What, um, what club are you playing at now? Who are you training with? Um, the problem in New York is we really don't have any clubs. So that's, that's one of, there's two obstacles, uh, to my training. Well, number one, I started school 10 years ago and I was going to school full time. Once that happened, it was really hard to maintain my level. Cause when I was training, I was playing like 30, 35 hours a week. But then in school, I went down to like six hours a week and I did that on and off pretty much for 10 years. So it was a little bit tough to maintain my best level. Um, but the problem in New York um, is that we really have no clubs. We have one club in College Point, which is really good, and the space is great, but the temperature is not so good all the time. Like in the winter, it's very cold. You can't play there. In the summer, it's a little too hot. You can't play. Um, so pretty much no club. We do have one in Westchester, which is very good, but that's a little far for me. It's about an hour and a half. And we also have one in New Jersey, which is not bad, which is really good also, but that's about an hour and a half each way also. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, I assume you've got a similar problem to kind of what we've got in London, where there's such a premium on space that, you know, with being in such a big city that it's just difficult to find anywhere where you'd actually be able to create a club and make it affordable. Yeah, it's really tough with the space. I mean, I would imagine, I think London may be even more difficult because I, uh, when I was in London for the Paralympics, that was the first time I went there and that was in 2012. And yeah, it was, it's tough. I can see with the space. Um, so yeah, that's one of the challenges in New York um, is, is really getting good space. Um, and it's also finding the players too. I mean, a lot of players coach 
you know, um, and that's what I do too, you know, so, you know, we have a, a lot of students, um, and then we have to match each other's schedules up. So it's not like we're, we're in Europe and we can just play, which is really good. Um, in the U S you can really make a good deal of money if you coach and teach people like, for example, if you do, you know, if you go to people's houses, depending on the rates, but you can charge at least a hundred U S dollars per hour, just teaching someone at their house. And, um, in the, there's a place called spin New York and, uh, we usually charge on average for a lesson, 70, $80 an hour. Plus the, the students pay for the table time. So they're paying on average about a hundred and sometimes 120 an hour. It depends on w when they take the lesson. So, um, that's what a lot of players when they're in New York, they're like, Hey, you know what? I can make decent money just coaching. And, and, and then they're just like, you know, what? I'm just going to coach. I'm just not going to play. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the things. Um, and you know, that happens in other places in, you know, in the United States too. I mean, a lot of coaches have done very well, um, teaching and that's really the main source of income. Um, that, well, if people are going to play, I mean, some people work and play, but again, that's, that's not easy as well um, to kind of, you know, have to work full time and then train. That's a little bit tough as well. So yeah. Not that easy. So, I mean, you've, you're have you now all kind of getting ready for, for Rio 2016, I assume. Don't you? You've got kind of six months or, or so to, to get yourself in shape for that? Yeah, I really have to push myself and get myself in shape. I've been feeling okay. The last nationals were okay, but... Um, you know, um, yeah, I have to really start training and make table tennis the first priority. Um, otherwise, it's, it's very tough. I mean, the guys that I face in Rio, I would say, I mean, of the para guys that play, I don't know. I, I mean, a lot of them would make the uh, U.S. national team for sure. I mean, there's probably, I don't know, at least 20, 30 of them that, that would have a good shot to make the U.S. national team. So they're very um, good, especially the Chinese players are really good. Um, and I think they have one player from Belgium that's pretty good. And yeah, they have a lot of, a lot of good players. There's also some from, um, you know, Germany that play well. There's one from Poland, I think that may be on the Polish national team. That's really good, but I'm not sure if he's on the team or he's five or six, but he's good. There's also someone from a couple of players from Russia and Ukraine that are really, really good. Tough competition coming up. Yeah, it'll be tough, but, but it's good. I mean, it's, it's. It's challenging, and um, and it's also you know the power game is different than the able-bodied game. You're kind of trying to figure out you know uh, you know where a player has a physical disability, um, and, but those players are very good at hiding their weaknesses, and it's very hard to get to their weaknesses. You have to have you have to play well and really have good feel for the ball. Yeah, that was actually something I wanted to ask you was you know the similarities and differences between. I know you play in, in all the para stuff. You also play in the, the able-bodied events in the U.S. Have, have you learned different things from, from playing in, in both at the same time? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, with the para players, it's, it's a lot more tactical. Um, but I will also say that because of the ball change, I mean, before, um, I think the game was more in your hands. You really had to have good feeling and good touch. But it seems now it's like the game is in your legs more and it's become more physical um, I mean, there's still obviously, you know, you have to have technique, but it, the game's really become a lot more physical, especially, you know, they change from the 38 ball to the 40 ball. And now with the plastic ball, it's even more physical. Um, so I think, uh, with the able-bodied game, it's really, um, I mean, in the United States, we don't have that many players that are actually doing proper physical training. So that's one advantage, um, that I've been able to compete with those players because they don't really have a good physical schedule. There's maybe about three or four of them that actually do real physical training of what's necessary. The rest of all the other players don't do that. So, um, you know, without that, it's very hard to get to the next level. So that's a big component for most of our players here. Um, they don't know, um, they haven't learned yet how to train physically or they don't have a, a, um, a personal trainer or a physical trainer. So, um, yeah, that makes a big difference, um, improvement wise. Um, but with the power game, it's, you know, nobody's really that good physically. So again, it becomes more tactically and, and you, you really have to find, you have to deal with, uh, all the changes of the ball and it's, it's just, it's a, it's a different game. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, I wanted to to move on and have a talk about your book, Ping Pong, uh, Ping Pong for Fighters. That's the title. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Ping Pong for Fighters. And I mean, some of what you said there really stood out to me in the book because you, know, you talk a lot about the the kind of concept of fighting. You you mentioned the idea of kind of competing and how a table tennis match is really a space to compete. I wonder if you could just elaborate on some of those ideas because I think they were that was like a really great way of of viewing table tennis and and I think it'd be great for people to hear your thoughts on that having played and competed for so long. Um I think there's a lot of components to that but I think one of the most important things is that look we you know we try to remember why we started playing table tennis you know we picked up the racket we you know like wow this is fun this is really great and all of a sudden later on we're like practicing and it just turns into something else it's just like man I've got to you know become this champion or I've got to you know, really, uh, you know, just win and excel. And, and, and we've just lost our focus on, I'm not going to say the process, but just on why we started playing. So one of the problems that I see with, with students and a lot of players is they're trying to define their sense of self through winning. So it's like, well, if I win, I feel really great. And, uh, and it just kind of attaches to my identity. And now, you know, I can walk around um, whatever I've won this championship and, and that. And I, I think you know, that kind of diminishes or takes away from, first of all, the art and the, the enjoyment of the game itself. Um, and of course, you know, we all want to win. I mean, you know, I mean, I fight every point. I want to win every single point. Um, but, you know, at the same time, um, I think defining our results, uh, defining who we are based on our results may not be the best way to improve. So that's number one. Um, and I think, um, you know, some of the other problems is that we can get too analytical about the game where it's like, you know, I mean, I guess the way to describe it, I'm a clinical therapist. So I, I think in those terms uh, a little bit. So um, it's like we have these kind of maladaptive behaviors that people do, you know, whether it's, you know, sometimes they do drugs or sometimes they, they do certain things to remove themselves away from actually being in the present moment and actually being in reality and actually I guess being comfortable with groundlessness and 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 things that occur that are out of their control. So it seems like in table tennis, you know, like we may have, you know, for example, you know, people that are just start focusing on the analytical parts of the game and they they really get an enjoyment of whether it's switching all this different equipment or whether it's um, you know, focusing on what they should do with the technique and 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 I think at some point um there comes a time where we have to move away from that focus and actually start playing matches and, and, and actually, um, kind of, I think I call it, I think there's, oh, there's something I wrote, which didn't get in the book, which was really weird. It was called, um, paralysis by analysis. So that's what I'm describing, kind of that problem. Um, so I don't know if I'm making it very clear here. So the, the only points I'm trying to make is one playing for the right reasons. And there's a, there's a coach who coaches soccer. His name is Dor- Dorrance Anson, and he talks a lot about that. Um, of just you know, there's there was some girl, I guess, in some video that that was just like, I want to be the national champion, and he's like, well, why? You know, I mean, what's what's the motivation or the reasoning behind that? So my suggestion is really for each player that's training to really evaluate yourself and say, you know, why am I doing this, and what do I want out of out of my career as a player? Because I think the bottom line is if you're doing something and you're not enjoying it, then you may not be able to reach your full potential or your full level. Yeah, definitely. I think obviously what you've picked up from from your studies outside of table tennis has definitely infiltrated into your thinking and given you, I guess, a bit more of a kind of holistic approach to the game and life and everything that goes into it. I think that that's actually really interesting and, and helpful for people because it's so easy to get to get distracted or just to really like, so I spoke to East Van Moldovan, you know, episodes ago, he was talking about people who are technique freaks and they just obsess about techniques or, or you go onto forums and you'll, you'll see, they talk about equipment junkies, people that kind of just obsessed with equipment. And I think you're right. It's, it's so easy to just get distracted by the wrong things and end up kind of going down this rabbit hole into something else. And, and tables and it starts to lose lose the competition lose the you lose the fun and it it just becomes a different thing altogether 
Yeah, I think that makes sense. And, and I, I, I think I like that, you know, even because um, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with Stellan Bankston, who is a, a, you know, a world champion and a, and a, and a, a very, very good uh, coach. And he kind of breaks the game into pieces and stuff. And he has all these different sections of, you know, of, of how to improve. And I think it, you know, it is important, you know, to take certain things out and work on them. I mean, you know, a, a lot of problems I think with players is that they have something like there's a lot of players that are that I see in the United States that whatever they're rated whatever it is 2100 22 2000 and they just they have parts of their game that are really really good but they can't get it into a match they just can't put that into a match and and I think part of that also is that knowing that table tennis itself is kind of like a partnership so you're really working with somebody, I mean, your victory kind of, or whatever you're playing well or whatever it is, is dependent partly on the person that you're playing against. So mm-hmm. if you're just focused on yourself, like I said, and you're focused on what you want to do and I, you know, what I want to win all this stuff cause I want to do this or I want to do that, or I, I've got to get my, you know, this shot, I've got to do that. You negate kind of what's going on on the other side of the table. Um, and I remember, uh, I spoke with Samson off. This was a long time ago. This must have been 15 years ago. And he uh, he was saying that the, uh, I think he was saying the good player is exclusively focused on the opponent while the beginner player is focusing on themselves. And he was saying yeah. in the practice, you can focus on yourself to improve the technique, but in the match, you have to focus only on your opponent. Yeah. I mean, I've got a list here of just little quotes from the book that, you know, I read and just had to write down because I thought they were just you know, like gold nuggets. I wonder if I could just throw a few of them at you and if you could just kind of explain what you mean behind the sentence, if that's all right. Sure. Yeah. So one I've got is kind of the idea that every match you play is 50, 50. Yep. Um, that's really, really important, you know, and that goes back to, you know, that match that I, you know, whatever ended up winning in 1998 is that, you know, when you, uh, when you believe well, first of all, they have this curve. It's kind of like, and it's written in a lot of the Olympic, you know, when you're, I, I spent time at the Olympic Training Center, and there's one person, um, I can't remember the name of the book, it's uh, with winning in mind, and he talks about either being too too pumped up, like too excited about the match, or too, you know, I guess too relaxed. Um, but when you go into a match knowing, you know what, that you're going to have two, three types of players that you're going to play, probably. One, the player could be below your level. Two, could be equal to your level. And three, they could be above your level. If the player is below your level and you, you're just like, oh, this will be an easy match, you know, it's not a big deal, you could lose that match. Because you're not really saying, you know what, this guy could beat me. I've got to play every single point. Now, if the player is above your level, you may say, oh, wow, this guy's too good. I can't beat this guy. You know, um, and if the player is equal to you, that might you may actually be normal and say, okay, I've got to fight. And that's really where you want to be. You want to be in a match where you believe that the players equal in ability, that you have some chance because everybody can't play their best on every, um, in every tournament. And one coach is really interesting from uh, actually South America. I don't remember where he was watching me play at the world championships in 2006. And he told me, he's like, you know, cause I, I was playing against a player named Frycheck and who was a lot better than I was. And, I I, uh, I ended up losing the match. I think I was up 7-4 in the last game. But he told me that even though the player's better than you, it doesn't mean they're going to beat you every single time. It just means they have more chances to beat you. So in that respect, it's like you've just got to fight all the time and believe, hey, you know what, I'm equal to this player. And I, I always believe I can win. And because of that, I've beaten players that are, you know, I mean, I'll almost... I mean, a lot of the players are better than me anyway, but I've beaten a lot of players that are way, way better than my ability just by believing and saying, you know, what, I'm going to compete on every point. Now, uh, the final thing I'll say about that, it's not that they just, you know, just played amazing. Maybe they, you know, you know, saw that I wasn't as well. They didn't try as hard in the beginning, or maybe, you know, they just didn't play that well that, that day, or maybe I just happened to play really well, but you don't know what can happen until you say, you know what, it doesn't matter about the level of play, the, the player. And that's really the problem, you know, when, you know, I was watching uh, the, you know, I think Germany had made the final of the team world championship. And I think they'd beaten Korea. I don't know if it was the Olympics or the team. And they were just so satisfied and so happy with making the final. Um, and I just thought, you know, if they can kind of believe a little bit, and they're probably closer to anybody, them and Korea, of challenging the Chinese, um, that they would they would have a better chance of just just saying you know what I feel like I I 
you know, I can compete with these guys. So I probably said too much about that, but that's, that quote just basically goes to self-belief and just realizing that you can, um, you can compete with anybody, you know, and that's really what that quote means. Yeah. Brilliant. I love that. Okay. Uh, another quote, you can't always play your best and you don't need to. You expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Jeez. I don't even remember writing that, but, um, that, um, yeah. Oh, actually, yeah. You know what? That that is saying that you know. Oh, that is actually really important. Um, you know, a lot of people go into the tournament and they're thinking, you know what? I'm going to be playing awesome, or they've got this routine or this sort of warm up that they do. They're like, oh, you know, I'll just do this and I'll do my exercises, or I'll start warming up forehands and then I'll warm up backhands and then I'll I'll do this and now I've got it. You know, I'm playing my best. Or they may train in a specific way for like three or four months, or they may have a tournament that they played before. And so I played really good. I'm playing really, really well. What they don't realize is that every single match is a new event. And just because you played really well for 10 matches doesn't mean you're going to play well the 11th. And just because you played poorly for 10 matches doesn't mean you're going to play poorly in the 11th match. So um, what that really simply means is that, you know, you can't... um, Actually, there was a player, David Zhuang, who was very, very good. And he told me... He's like, when you go into a really important tournament that's really, really important, like a team trials or a, I think he played in the Olympics or the Pan Am Games, he's like, you don't want to feel your best. He's like, you want to be somewhere in the middle and, um, you know, you want to be able to just try to play the best that you can. Because sometimes when you feel your best, you may be overconfident. I mean, there was a lot of other reasons, Um, but the point of that, quote was really just saying that you can't play your best all the time and good players can win when they're not playing their best yeah and and then I guess to follow up from that so because obviously when when we go on the table we want to feel amazing we want to feel like right it's really clicked I'm in the zone whatever but often we're not in that place and for some reason things just aren't working we don't feel like on on top form what are some things that we can do in those situations? Because I think, you know, if you look at inexperienced players or juniors, maybe they, they come off the table and they say, oh, you know, I can't play, I'm not playing well. And they kind of use that as an excuse to not try or, or just to kind of to lose the match. What, what can you do if you get on the table for whatever reason, you're missing shots, you're not feeling that sharp? What can you do to, to kind of turn that around and, and actually go forward with it? Um, well, I mean, there are definitely... Uh, well, first of all, there's self-talk. You know, I mean, how you talk to yourself really makes a difference. That's number one. Number two, I mean, there are points and, you know, athletes go through slumps. They have, sometimes they're not really playing that well. And yeah, that's that's a positive or could be negative. But um, the main the main thing is to really say, okay, there's two things. And this is what, what I try to tell myself. There's things I can control and things I have no control over. So even if I'm not feeling well, which, you know, physically sometimes I'm not, I mean, I have a full torn ACL. I have so many problems with my back and sometimes I feel so poorly, but I can't control that. I have no control over that. And I'll, I'll, um, give you one example of that is when I played, I played in, in 2004, we had the Olympic, we had doubles. So it was a a qualifier for the Olympics. And I I was with my partner, who's my coach, Sean O'Neill, who hadn't trained, I don't know, in like 10 years. And we were like, Oh, we just want to try out for the Olympics for doubles. It'd be fun. And we were, uh, we had to play one match against two players that were on the U S national team and we were, I want to say, I think we were down 3-2, and my whole back went out. I mean, I just couldn't even move. So they were working on my back for 10 minutes. Um, and then we just realized, you know what, we just can't control that. And we came up with a strategy on what to do. And, I mean, we, we ended up winning the match, and that's not always going to be the case. And we became whatever Olympic qualifiers and all that stuff. But we ended up playing Canada. That's another story. But um, the point is that you just have to deal with what you have and where you're at. You know, so... If you're not playing well, okay, fine. I can't control that right now. But uh, the most important thing, and, and the final thing I'll say about that, is that most good players realize, and I learned this at the Olympic Training Center, is that nobody goes in and just plays well. They have to kind of feel it, and it's something that you build on. And I think the main problem is people want to go into the match and feel great right away. And that mm. doesn't happen for good athletes. I don't, I, I don't think that ever re- – I mean, it can happen, but usually it's something that they build up on. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, uh, last last one that we'll go go through is um, fight your opponent, not yourself. Um, yeah, that's really important. Um, and you know, all of these things I will mention. You know, I mean, these everything that you're describing and you're saying, and these are things that I struggle with all the time, and we all struggle with. And you know, and there's some days where I'm able to overcome those things. I'm talking about myself as an athlete, and there's other days that I'm not. 
you know. Um, but that's what's really, really important of of not battling yourself, and that goes back to how you're feeling. It goes back to uh, you know thinking in the future. Um, anytime you're playing a match and you're not in the present moment and you're not really thinking about what needs to be done, um, then you're you know you're not really playing your optimal level. And I think the real strong proof of that was the 2003 World Championships. I mean, Schlager was down 10-6 in two different matches, and I think he was down 3-2. And the players, you know, his opponents, you know, um, relaxed, you know, thought about the future, about the victory, and then they left, you know, the present moment, and he just really continued playing. And, and he's, a, he's a player um, that... I mean, I really learned a lot from with watching him with his mental game. His mental game is so good. But then I think after the world, something changed. And that's another thing that's interesting. He really had such a strong mental game before the 2003 Worlds. And then after he had won the Worlds, it's almost like it got into his self-identity. And then I think when he got in the matches, he was expecting to win. And, and it just his performance was never the same. Um, but that's something altogether. And I actually lost what I was responding to. What was the question? <laughs> Uh, the, no, that, that was interesting the, the quote was fight your opponent yep. not yourself and i know because I, I know in the past that i've seen videos where you know and you mentioned it yourself in the book like um oh, you said something about one of the great things about playing in like para world events was that if you started going too mental you'd be kicked out so you like had to <laughs> you, like, had, you, you were forced to like control yourself but yeah it's like you know the idea of not you know, not being your own worst enemy, actually concentrating on beating the opponent. Yeah, I think um, it is important to be able to, you know, I, I guess, yeah, not beating yourself. Sometimes, I mean, it depends. I mean, you know, you do have to pump up. I know Thomas um, Kainath from Germany, he's like, sometimes you got to get angry. And he's like, he says he watches Save and Save sometimes just is down. He just pumps himself up. So, I mean, everybody's... Um, I guess demeanor and how they, their behavior on the table and how they feel is different. But I think when you're completely out of control and you realize what, how you're responding, you're just not in control. That's where it can get dangerous, you know, and you, you could be in a little bit of trouble. Um, so it's really important to be able to, to have some, some level of self-control. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right. There, there's actually, there's one more thing from the book that I wanted to, sure. to discuss it's um, I mean, it's not it's not a snippet like that. It's more of like a coaching suggestion. It was something that when I read it, I thought that's actually a really interesting idea and something that I hadn't come across before. But it was the idea of if you don't like playing long pimples or or anti spin or or whatever, some other kind of style, instead of trying to you know find other practice partners that use long pimples and things, you you gave the suggestion of you know maybe actually buy a sheet of long pimples yourself replace it on your on your bat with with some long pimples and try using it for a few weeks and and it was the idea that actually if you can learn how to use you know the rubber that you hate playing yourself then when you then go back to a tournament you're facing it you should be a lot more equipped at knowing how to beat that kind of rubber and i just thought that was really fascinating is that something that you've tried did you pick that up from a coach like where did that come from well i mean i i definitely did that the only uh, the thing that i remember was that when i was reading um some stuff about waldner and apple green they used to play with different types of rubber like long pips and and all that stuff and um i had trouble against i mean i wanted to understand long pips so it was really helpful i used it in tournaments for about four months on my backhand and once i did that i got really really good against uh, playing against it so that was helpful, and there was there was one player who played um, that was really really good, and he had a Chinese. It was like a hurricane on his backhand, and he beat me three times, and I just couldn't deal with that ball. It was just so difficult for me to deal with. And then I put the, I tried it myself, and I used it on my backhand for a couple of months, um, just playing matches, and then I didn't lose him again. So I I really think that's important because it really gets you a feel of what, you know. You just feel the ball better. It was really helpful for me, and, and that's and that's one of the things with the what I tried to do with this book. I really tried my best with, and I had a lot of help. I mean, from Stellan, from a, a lot of different coaches, of just trying to all the information that's in the book, trying to um, make sure it was good information. Yeah, I really enjoyed the book, and I think what's what's great about the book is that. You know, from reading it, I really felt like I got to know you because I could tell that these are kind of like notes that you've 
written down from experiences over so many years that, that then you've kind of sat down and put together into one work. And I assume that, you know, you've been jotting things down. You say that, you've, you know, you like to keep a journal and things it's for years and years. And, and that's kind of how the book came about, is it? Um, yeah, I mean, I took, uh, basically, I, I played the sport for 25 years uh, at the international level. So, um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, in 1996, which was really a great experience for me, I, I ended up, it was actually a, a combination of luck. I ended up winning a gold medal in the Paralympics and the players were better than me. And it was just this whole, and I, I went back thinking about that. I really didn't have any pressure at that point because I just didn't know what to expect. And I, I was also thinking, oh, you know, I'm not really disabled. I feel normal. So it's not a big deal. I didn't really take the event as seriously, you know, even when, you know, it was like, whatever, there were thousands of people in the stands. I was like, oh, it's just another tournament. Um, so I think that opportunity, it, it gave me that, once that happened, it gave me an opportunity to really speak with a lot of different players and work with a lot of coaches like Stellan Bankston and you know, even Sean O'Neill and some of the top, whatever, uh, you know, some of the Chinese coaches. And I've been all over the world and, and watched a lot of different training. And every time something was said or I just saw something and I kind of discussed, I was like, all right, let me write this down um, because it seems interesting. And, um, so that's kind of what I did. And, and then I, I had all this stuff and I was like, how could it, how could it apply to like the average player? And I really started thinking about, cause I also have been coaching table tennis for probably at least 15 years. So I was trying to kind of take some of the problems players had and some of my experience and mix it up. And that's how the book came about. Um, so I will say, though, it's not really – I mean, I found in the U.S., if somebody's looking for a book where they really want to analyze stuff and there's just a lot of information, it probably may not be for them. And also, it may also not be for somebody that's just really starting out and just beginning. It's more for somebody, I think, that's just playing tournaments and kind of trying to figure stuff out And because there's a lot of experiences with just trying to deal with playing well in a tournament and, and, and a lot of other things. And so – there have been some people that, that, you know, some people didn't like the book, uh, which is good, you know, um, but there was, uh, there's a lot of people that really got a lot out of it. And, and you know, when I go to tournaments and uh, I, um, you know, a lot of people talk to me about the book and it's, it's actually sold pretty well. Um, so um, I, I think that, you know, after I wrote the book, I mean, for me personally, and I, I was very satisfied with it because I had, I'd gotten so much help from from uh, some, you know, a lot of different coaches and a lot of different players, I really felt it was good, um, especially for a first book. And I mean, uh, I was really happy with it. So, yeah, and I think, you know, for one thing, you can't, you, you know, you just can't please everyone. So you're always <laughs> going to have people that, you know, that, that say whatever. But I think if you're the kind of player who is struggling with those kind of questions of you know, why is my performance in tournaments so up and down? Why, you know, why are there times when I feel like pulling my hair out? I just want to quit because I, you know, I can't do it or, you know, all of those issues that serious competitive table tennis players go through. I think it's brilliant to kind of, you know, read a, an honest account of, you know, your own experiences and how you've dealt with it. I think, yeah, I think it's going to be a valuable tool for anyone in that kind of situation. Well, I think with, with also with any player in what you're describing of, of just having them, you know, if, if a player is feeling frustrated or they're just, you know, not satisfied with whatever it may be in table tennis, I think it's good to really strip down the entire game and just go back to basics and say, you know what, why am I winning the points and why am I losing the points? And that's what it kind of goes back to a little bit. And it's like, and there's two real... I guess possibilities. Um, you know, I'm either losing the point because the player is better than me and I can't match them technically. Like my technique in some way is just not as good and may need to improve, or my tactics are not good. And I'm just placing the ball poorly, or you know, I'm you know, you know, a basic thing is that some players like it when you play the ball fast and they don't like it when you play slow. You know, that's kind of uh important to really figure out, you know, not in a crazy analytical way, but you know what, why am I losing these points? What's happening? Instead of saying, oh, you know, I, you know, why am I here? Oh, this is, I've been training for six months. I've been doing this. Okay. Why am I losing the points? Is there something the guy's doing that I can't deal with? Is it, um, something that I just can't do? Um, am I playing just the wrong tactics? Because there's somebody out there that's going to probably beat that player or compete with them. 
So you want to find out, okay, can I compete with the guy that I'm competing with? How can I do that? And, you know, you may find, all right, you know, I've had players that I'm like, wow, these guys are just so good physically, and I just can't match that. Is there something I can do, um, you know, you know, to, to or, you know, for example, I was playing a really good player, um, and we were training the other, I couldn't receive a serve. So it's like, darn, you know, I mean, if I could just receive this guy's serve, I know I, I, because I, I was losing like 4-2. It's like, you know, I think I could win the match if I could just receive the serve. So I just tried all these different things. And then um, the thing that worked is I took my racket when he, he was serving this kind of reverse serve, and I just moved my racket almost outside the court. I don't know how to describe it, but I, I moved my racket all the way to the right, and I made a good receive because I was receiving really directly towards the ball. And it just so that was the one thing, and that made such a huge difference. And then I, was, I, I didn't feel pressure from that serve because he had three different spin variations and was really, really well-placed. But once I did that, I was like, oh, wow, geez, you know, that's – I guess that will help me. So it could be something as simple as that. Or again, it could be, you know, your, you know, your technique in some way needs to be modified or, you know, I mean, if the guy's getting you in the backhand and backhand exchanges and it's like, oh, you can't get out of that. You can't deal with, that's the key. So it's just really analyzing and saying why, you know, why am I losing these points? Why am I winning the points? Not only losing, what points am I winning? And then you go from there. And um, that would be my advice to any players, at least the starting point. Brilliant. I think that's great. And I think, you know, I'm sure people will have got loads of great information from this podcast. It's brilliant having you on, Tal, and talking to you. Um, if people want to find out a little bit more about you, maybe follow your training and in, in the lead up to, to Rio, are you on social media? Um, yeah, you know, I, um, I, I do have a ping pong for fighters page. I did put up a what's it called? GoFundMe page. But I don't know if I've gotten any, any funding yet from that. So, um, but, um, I, I guess following, um, you know, I mean, if you check out usatt.org, they usually have some articles, but this may be my last year of kind of playing. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to stop and cause I want to help people. I'm, I'm a social worker. So I want to be able to do like kind of clinical work and change from table tennis. Um, but I think usatt.org is a good place. And, and if anybody's interested in the book, it's on amazon.com and it's ping pong for fighters. And, um, yeah, I think that's it. And I think people, um, you know, I wish people good luck in their training and in their sport and their game. And, and that's it. Nice. Great. Thanks for coming on, Tal. Okay, thank you for having me. Best of luck in Rio. And yeah, wish you, wish you success with everything that you go on to do after table tennis. Thank you. And um, have a great, I guess, afternoon or evening. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Cheers. See you later, Tal. Okay, be well. Thanks. Bye. Bye. A big thank you to Tal for joining me on this episode of the podcast. Loads of great tips and wisdom in that interview. I think probably my favorite bit was the bit where he spoke about every match being 50-50 and how important it is to go into games, whether we're playing up, playing down, playing someone at our level, expecting a battle and getting ready to have to play well in order to win. And, and if we're playing up against someone who's ranked higher than us, believing that you know we can beat them on the day just because they're higher ranked than us doesn't mean that the match is a certainty. Really good advice. I hope you put that into your game. I'd encourage you to head over to Amazon and buy Tal's book as well. You can get that on Amazon.com or .co.uk, wherever you are, on Kindle and in paperback. If you're looking for the show notes for this episode, you can find those by going to experttablesinners.com forward slash episode 31. There you'll get some links and a little bit of other information about the episode. That's all from me for today. I'll be back in a month's time with the next episode of the Expert Table Tennis podcast. Thanks for listening and head over to experttabletennis.com to find out a little bit more about me and what I'm doing with the site. See you next month.